Uh, my name's Phil, I like talking about politics, and in this video, I'd like to discuss the hopes that maybe a silver lining in Russia's war on Europe could, out of sheer necessity, bring closer cooperation between the UK and the EU. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So our theory is simple enough here. This winter, there's going to be an energy crisis. You may think there's one now. No, this winter. Countries in Europe, including both the UK as well as most EU countries, are wanting to wean themselves off Russian fuel in order to make economic sanctions bite Putin harder than them. This is not straightforward. Russia exports an awful lot of oil and gas and Europe wants an awful lot of oil and gas. The UK government have been reportedly telling hospitals to make sure their generators are serviced and that their diesel tanks are full ahead of possible power cuts this winter. Germany's been getting people uh, used to conserving energy, parts of Spain likewise, something the Brexiteers in this country scoff at. Scoff at it, they do. But it serves a dual purpose. We could do with using less energy, regardless of the geopolitics, and we are going to face shortages. Also, for Brexiteers that would cheer the idea of shortages of anything in the EU, they would do well to consider what that means for us. When the EU has a shortage of anything, we feel it more keenly because they prioritise their own market. And their market's larger. We saw this on a smaller scale last year. Many people may have missed this, but there were shortages of carbon dioxide in this country. Britain couldn't import any for some time. Northern Ireland could, because they retained access to the single market. Where there was a shortage, Britain couldn't get any because it's like, no, we need it for ourselves. But Northern Ireland, oh yeah, sure, mate, you've got this special deal with us. If the EU suffer energy shortages, we're going to struggle. And, and when we can buy from them, we'll be paying a lot more for it. That's already happened before. So no, shortages in the EU is, is nothing for an island off their northern coast, utterly dependent upon imports to delight in. And consider the situation from the government's point of view, the UK government's point of view. Consider what is going to happen this autumn. Liz Truss, who's almost certainly going to be Prime Minister, she won't want to damage her reputation with the public. It'll be really important. She's not going to start off on a great, in a great place. I don't know where the polls will end up being a week or two after she's made Prime Minister, but it's not going to be an amazing position for her. She won't be able to afford to lose much credibility. Now, if she does, she won't win it back because the country's in a right old mess and it's not going to get any better before the election. Before winter, she will have had to deal with energy bills rising out of all semblance of affordability. She'll have had to deal with potential wide range and industrial action. If she doesn't tackle either of these major problems, she's not going to avert the recession that is forecast to last all of next year. She's not going to want that on her record. But only serious action will avert it. That's assuming anything can avert it at this point. Although Truss may well do something significant. I know she's talking a lot right now about not doing anything to help people with energy bills and trying to make industrial action illegal, but neither of these policies is sustainable. And I think she knows it. What we're getting from her right now is a load of bluff for the benefit of the Tory party members. I mean, it's very difficult to project what she would do as Prime Minister based on what she says now, because what she says now is purely for that Tory party membership. Once she wins the contest, she'll have to then ignore them to an extent and pay attention to target voters. And target voters do not want to work for slave wages while the cost of energy bills accounts for more than a quarter of the income of a full-time worker. Then, if Truss negotiates those challenges, she's got the meltdown of the NHS to hide. I mean, she's not actually going to do anything to help there. Her strategy will be to hide the damage her party has done over the last 12 years. It's going to be difficult. Then there's the prospect of energy cuts, power cuts. A party that's been in government for over a decade cannot afford dropping standards of living at a rate that is noticed by voters. And power cuts would be a very visible example of this. People go, oh, oh yeah, do you remember how this is quite normal for us? No, not at all. This is not normal for us. Truss will ideally want to avert power cuts completely, and if that's not possible, at least greatly reduce their regularity. And this is where Brexit comes into it. During the negotiations for our trade and cooperation agreement, 
Do you remember a lot of talk about energy? No, nor me. There was a lot of talk about fishing and, uh, and checks at the border. Lots of talk about the trading goods and access to each other's market. Not a lot about services. The bottom line is that we separated ourselves from the EU's energy grid. It wasn't necessary. Brexit supporters around the country would not have been up in arms had we not. But they did it anyway. Boris Johnson was basing his entire Brexit policy on separating from the EU as much as possible. But this is going to be a problem now. I mean, it's been a problem before. It has also absolutely contributed to the cost of energy bills. But it's going to be a massive problem. We've lost our easy and efficient access to energy sources from around Europe. Like everything related to Brexit, it doesn't help either side. It also means the EU are cut off from our network. So we have two energy grids in Europe, essentially, two large ones. This is not efficient, doesn't suit either side. Before now, it served the Tories' political needs to have separations from the EU of this sort, and the cost wasn't noticeable to the public. But this inefficiency will lead to power cuts that could otherwise be averted. There may well be a powerful motivation for Liz Trust to want to merge our networks. At least the North Sea wind farms grid, because we have such a lot of them. This means the EU would also be keen, but it's politically tricky. For the Tory government, they've got MPs within their ranks pushing for the destruction of the Northern Ireland Protocol. The bill to achieve this is passing through Parliament right now and has already cleared the House of Commons stages. This presents a political problem for the EU as well. Even though it's of mutual interest, it's tricky to justify letting the UK reconnect grids against a background of screwing over Ireland. But I've seen a report in the Financial Times from a Brussels correspondent that suggests that the EU and the UK have been in close contact over this issue. So it's not just that there's a theoretical possibility because of mutual interest that the UK and the EU could work on this. They actively are at the moment. It means that despite the rhetoric that you may read in the Daily Express from time to time, behind the scenes, the UK government is fully seized of the need to come to an agreement for mutual benefit. There's also been bad news for various European countries due to the ravaging heat waves that we're getting. You know, we've, we've heard the stories, presumably, of French nuclear power stations struggling to cool. Norwegian hydropower reservoirs drying up. The Rhine in Germany getting very low. That's used to transport coal, I gather. You know, I'll tell you what worries me. On the one hand, it's really clear there is a mutual benefit in reconnecting power grids. So, of course, we should do it. Helps us both. Why wouldn't we? It means access to energy becomes more efficient. When supplies are stretched, efficiency is vital. The problem is there are still these political wrangles in the background. And because the energy crisis is biting both the EU and the UK, there's a danger that the UK government thinks it has the upper hand in negotiations. You know how they were during the previous Brexit negotiations. And that's my worry, actually, that the next Prime Minister, almost certainly Liz Truss, is trapped in a political corner of her own making, feels the need to be seen to be getting one over on the EU and allows herself to believe, and I'm sure we've heard this bomb before, that the EU needs this more than we do. It's a, like a lot of the Brexit outcomes. We fell into them accidentally. If Dominic Cummings is to be believed, and that's a big if, then Boris Johnson didn't go into the Brexit negotiations with his eyes wide open. Cummings claims to have bounced Johnson into a harsher Brexit than he thought he'd be getting because of a basic lack of understanding about how, the, how either the EU or third country status works. Truss may do the same. She might fail to agree mutually beneficial energy cooperation with the EU, not out of nihilistic lunacy, but purely through miscalculation. And if we suppose that whatever goodwill the public may have towards Truss when she first takes the reins of power fades against a cost of living crisis where she doesn't really do much better than Johnson did, imagine what power cuts would do to her reputation this winter, especially if they're so bad that deaths are linked to them. But it may well be that she does take the matter seriously. Like I said, an energy agreement with the EU needn't be high profile. And it's not something that Brexit supporters are going to be all that bothered about. You tell someone who still supports Brexit now, oh, we're going to have, uh, we're going to link up our energy grids with the EU so that we don't have to have power cuts. All right, then. So, you know, so as long as she can keep the swivel-eyed loons and her party in line, there should be no reason why we can't end 2022 on better terms, at least, with our neighbours than we began them on. 
After all, mutual threats are a very good way to heal divisions. And it would be funny, wouldn't it, if Russia, who supported Brexit with quite a lot of resources in order to divide Europe, ended up he helping to heal those divisions from its actions this year. But those are my thoughts. Let me know yours in the comments below. Hope you found the video interesting. If you did, please click the like button. If you'd like to support the channel further, the join button for memberships. And until next time, I'll see you later.